is a flock of wham-wams. Yes, it is. Welcome, everyone. Hi, everyone. And everyone out there in the break room, come on in. It's the public policy consultation. I know people are interested in pretzels and public policy. Hopefully, so yeah, so we should eventually get some people. Very good. I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm going to uh, do a little introduction about what this session is about. And then um, we'll actually start going through the discussion of the open policy proposals. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> I thank the comic relief team. Okay. Public policy consultation. This is an open discussion of the Internet Number Resource Policy. Um, it's uh, held by Aaron and it facilitates in person and remote participation. We're going for both today. Um, it may be held at our, we hold them every time we have a public pol every time we have a public policy meeting, we do a lot of consultations, but we also hold them at other forums that we think are relevant. Currently the only list that we're willing to try this out right now on is NANOG, and uh, we've done one before, we're doing this one. Uh, we think that this is a good community to be at. Uh, we think the cross-pollination is helpful. So uh, I'll give um, a couple of quick things, we'll do an update on the current policies, uh, and then we'll go through each of the draft policies that are out there. Uh, and this includes the inter-RIR transfer policy proposal, the 3GP network IP resource policy proposal, the RIR principles policy proposal, and the LIR ISP end user definition proposal. Welcome remote participants. Do we have remote participants? Yes, okay. There should be a webcast. Um, I'd like to thank the people for whatever measures it took to get that back up for this. Uh, should be a live transcript. There's someone else at the end of the remote webcast who's transcripting it and putting it out there. So be, understand there's a little lag, but there is a transcript. Downloading meeting material file you can get online. There's a chat room, which has an on-record virtual microphone and a hands-up show of support. When we ask for show of support, you can be counted. Okay, um, the chair, in this case vice chair, uh, Paul Anderson, will moderate the discussions of the actual draft policies so everyone can speak and all can be heard. Please state your name and affiliation each time you're at the microphone. Please comply with the courtesies that are in the discussion guide. If you're in the room, there's this handy dandy discussion guide. If you didn't get one, there's a bunch on the table over there, but I also see Susan passing them out. Very good. Okay, at the head table, Paul Anderson, myself, Kevin Bloomberg, uh, Bill Dart, who's our Jabber monitor, uh, Scott Lybrand, who's with the AC, and John Sweeting, who's the chair of the AC. So, uh, John Sweeting's gonna give the update on the AC council activities. Hopefully, uh, all right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, John Sweeting, AC chair, I'm gonna give a quick, quick update on advisory council activities. So as John said, we have four draft policies that will be presented today. Uh, what we're looking for is feedback and input on whether you think the uh, policies um, are crafted correctly and, and what we can do to uh, change them to make them more effective. Um, and, if, and if you support them or if you're against it, of course, uh, we're always interested in how many people we can get supporting these policies. Um, we also have two policy proposals, uh, although it says newer items, one isn't really a newer item, one is, uh, I believe, 182, Einer. Kind of change the slides, okay, let me go to the next. Okay, so there's the draft policies, John already talked about these, uh, we've got the inner RIR transfers of ASNs, the 3GP network IP resource. <coughs> The RIR principles, which is the uh, 2050 debate that's going on on PPM, PPML right now today with a, with a lot of good discussion. Um, hopefully uh, we can keep it up at a level of good discussion and uh, keep the, uh, the bad remarks out of there. Uh, just respect everybody on the list. and put your opinion out there and, and let other people put their opinions out there, please. 
Um, and then the LIR, ISP, and end user definitions. Oh, so um, proposal 186, section 8.2, reorganizations. This proposal, when uh, the AC looked at it, it seemed that it really what didn't need to be a policy, draft a recommended policy that had to go all the way through the process. So we uh, posted it out on PPML and asked for input. Um, if there was any objections to us handling this as an editorial change to the NER to the NERPM, and uh, that period ended, I believe May 29th or 30th. There were no objections noted, so the intent of the AC is at our next call to vote to recommend this to the Board of Trustees as an editorial change to the NERPM. Uh, the, the, the real reason that, that we believe that was because Chris Grundeman, who ended up rewriting 8.2 for an earlier policy, um, actually you know, said, ooh, I, I just left that out by mistake. His, his intent was not to leave that word out, so we're just actually putting the word back in that was there all along prior to that change and that Aaron was still following that guidance even today. So that proposal will most likely be uh, eliminated once we make that recommendation to the board. And then there's Aaron Proposal 189, allocation of IPv4 and IPv6 address space to outer region requesters. Um, that is uh, an ongoing, we, just, we got it in like the day before our last call, so we couldn't do much with it at our last call, so it's still in the proposal state. And that's it. I would like to uh, put in a um, good word for the AC. The AC does go out and support a lot of community outreach uh, functions, um, the Aaron on the Road and, and several others. And uh, also, uh, as you can see, we're, we're here supporting this PPC here at Nanog. Yes, Lee. My name is Lee Howard uh, from Time Warner Cable. Really? Um, I, th I, th <laughs> I think you and I may have met <laughs> once, right? Yeah, um, I think I see you sometimes. Uh, I think you used an acronym that maybe not everybody in the room is familiar with. I, I don't know if you spelled out what NERPM means. Yeah, I can. Um, <laughs> I was going to. No, yeah, that was, I was number thinking resource network. policy number manual. Number resource policy man. I couldn't it get is, past what John just whispered. Network because it was stuck in there. It, it, is, it is in fact Aaron's Aaron's policies. Yeah. Uh, the other actually, I, but I also wanted to ask: Do you want to? Or is there? Uh, is this an opportunity for discussion of the um, proposals that you just discussed, or are those not up for discussion right now? And you want to get to the uh, draft policies? Uh, draft policies are the priority for the okay. meeting, so we're going to go through them first. Thank you, John. Okay, uh, I'm going to do the introduction uh, for the draft policies under the discussion. The first one we'll discuss is recommended draft policy 2013-1. Um, this has been recommended by the AC. They found it properly formed, uh, and it is a candidate potentially to go to the Board of Trustees after it's or, uh, go to last call in preparation to go to the Board of Trustees. Um, this is section 8.4 change, inter RIR transfer for ASNs. The history uh, started out as a proposal in 2012. The AC Shepherd, Scott Lybrand, and R Rob Seastrom was presented at NANOG 57, uh, was promoted to recommended draft policy in 2013. It was presented at Aaron 31 uh, in April 2013 uh, at our Barbados meeting. It's on the AC's docket. Uh, the text is available and in the discussion guide, both online and in the discussion guide. Staff summary would allow the transfer of ASNs along with IPv4 address space <coughs> in an 8.4 inter RIR transfer and applies all the same criteria currently listed for IPv4 to ASNs. No similar proposals or discussions. That's uh, something to be considered is without similar proposals or discussions, this requires a matching policy proposal at the receiving RIR because uh, it's an inter RIR transfer policy. So we're, we're, if this was adopted, it would be one hand. Uh, there would need to be some other RIR doing something else. I don't know how much of a priority it is one way or the other in the other RIRs. Staff legal assessment, 
The policy is clear and can be implemented as written. Um, it would be a minimal resource impact and it poses no particular legal issues. Previous discussions, um, very little co communication on this or conversation, no post for or against on the public policy mailing list. Uh, and uh, with 102 people in the room, we had seven in favor and eight against at Aaron 31. Uh, and uh, when asked, should the AC work on this, eight in favor, 12 against. So it's a fairly um, lukewarm policy. No one particularly loves it or hates it from what we can determine. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to um, who? Uh, Scott to uh, do the AC presentation for it. Okay, apparently I get a cue. All right, so this policy proposal is quite simple. Um, ASNs are already transferable within the region, not transferable out of region. So this would allow that if another RAR were interested in doing so. Um, the benefits of doing that, obviously idle ASN resources could be recovered and used. Um, the registry could be updated when ASNs are transferred because of business needs of various sorts when, um, when I, many of the actual use cases that we've seen so far are not people selling addresses to someone else. They're, I, oh, I'm using this address in this other place for this other reason and I need to update the records and a 8.3 transfer has been the easiest way to do that in a lot of cases. So this would allow, if another region participated, an 8.4 transfer to do similar things. Um, and it allows for some parity between the, the policies for in-region and inter-region. Um, most of the uh, folks who have spoken out against this have done so on the basis that this isn't really necessary um, for several reasons. One might be that they don't think that uh, ASN transfers were necessary to begin with. Um, another might be that there um, simply is no shortage of them. And as John already mentioned, without a similar transfer policy allowing that in another region, there is simply nothing um, that this policy proposal does um, in that situation. So our questions as the AC to you as the community are, is this necessary and useful? And should we move this forward or abandon it? Um, as you saw on the previous slides, we had some lukewarm response from the community. Um, because most of the folks who spoke up in favor of this policy proposal were from the Nanog community, um, I felt it was important to bring it back here and hear from you guys if you really think this needs to um, move forward. I'd like to hear from you guys at the mic and or with your hands up when we ask the question. Um, in the absence of any interest, then I'd like to hear people's um, opinion on whether we should just go ahead and abandon this as unnecessary. So one way or the other, I'd like to um, get your input as to whether we can make a decision here. Thank you, Scott. So uh, as pointed out, uh, this is the audience participation portion. So if you have any comments or questions uh, on this proposal, again, as Scott stated, we, we were really struggling because we're just not getting a lot of support. So if you could stand up now if you're in the room and come up and say, state your name, your affiliation, and whether you support or do not support this policy. Here, let me model that behavior. Lee Howard, Time Warner Cable, oppose, mildly. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's necessary. Um, I, don't, I don't know that it's useful, but I did want to ask a question because I, I believe that this would modify or be, be affected section 8.4, right, of the, of the policy manual, so there's specified transfers for inter-RIR in our, in our, inter transfers, which says that the, um, who may take may only take place via excuse me, take place only via RIRs who agree to the transfer and share reciprocal compatible needs based policy. Um, do we have needs based policy for ASNs? You have to demonstrate that you need an ASN. Is that correct? And do other RIRs also have needs based ASN policies? Mr. Kern. Um, so recognize that that we don't preemptively mail people postcards with random ASNs on them. They have to actually say they want one. Mm -hmm. That for purposes of ASN is saying you have need, uh, and it's the same in the other RIR. So we recognize such as a needs-based policy. Um, the level of rigor varies by RIR. In some RIRs, you actually have to say, I'm tending towards multi-homing. 
or some equivalent statement. And so it is not necessarily, each RIR determines what is appropriate there. So can I infer that you would read the other RIR's needs-based policies as compatible? When another RIR passes a policy <laughs> or proposes one that's similar, I will stand in their forum and tell them whether it's compatible or not, which I've done for all the inter-RIR policies so far. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I can't preempt even, that. I, even less useful then. <laughs> right. Thank you. Others that uh, have a view on this policy ask you to approach the mic, or we also, of course, have remote participation, so please feel free to start typing madly if you would like to ask, have a question right here by our Jabber monitor. Yeah, John, go ahead. And Lee, I wasn't trying to be flippant, but I wanted to be very clear. Right now, the current ASN policies of the other, other RIRs may or may not be need-based at all. So, I mean, it, the, the level of need is hard to discern. It varies by RIR. Someone, while proposing a policy for inter-RIR transfer in another RIR, might say, for purposes of transfer, here's the need-based test. Uh, just like in the ripe region, they may eliminate need assessment for IPv4 as a general thing in their policy manual. That doesn't preclude someone introducing one a policy that introduces needs assessment simply for transfers. So we really need to see the specific policy proposal before it can comment. Other comments or feedback on this proposal? Again, we're, we're really struggling. We need, feedback is useful even if just to come up and say you're in support or against. Center microphone. Stacy Hughes, TW Telecom. I will vote to abandon this as an AC member because it's irrelevant. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. If we don't see an, any other uh, people approaching the mic and, oh, and any Jabber comments yet, we have one queuing up. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Handel, Louisiana State University. I'm very new to this space, so Welcome. I thought ASNs were unique and global. Why, do, why are we talking about transferring from one R&R to another? John? Um, and I have no view in, I mean, I'm the staff. I have no view in favor or opposed. Whatever you decide, folks decide makes sense. Um, we do have cases where people may have a, a business unit that's moved to another location, uh, or they may have a, some sort of change that they've gone through, and they find themselves able to update the records for IPv4, but they may not be able to indicate that that business is now in another region in another RIR, for example, because our policies say once it's assigned to you, you can use it or you can return it. it. We don't recognize, and we do recognize transfers within the Aaron region. Even though someone can come get a new ASN, why would you transfer one? You want to update the records accordingly because it's been moved to a new business. So if it's moved to a new business in another region, there presently is no way to officially recognize that it's left the building. Does that make sense? I'm not sure it, that use case comes up very often, but it is a possible use case. Far rear microphone. Yeah, Jared Mach, NTT. If I want to update a record and provide you a valid address and it's not in your region, will you update it, even if it's the correct address? Um, <laughs> so the organization, if the organization is in the Aaron region, um, then are you saying you're changing the organization record to reflect it's now out of region because the organization moved? Maybe my mailing address is out of region. We've had that happen. I mean, we there's no in, okay. there's no enforcement of that per se, but there are people who want to reflect the fact that the business is broken up into pieces. They're still here, but that piece is now in another region. Go ahead. Okay, so I I, I think what it sounds like is that this proposal may not be necessary because you will update the records based on the resource, the, the request of the person for whom the resources have been allocated to, even if they're uh, outside of the region. Perfect. Right. Kevin, Bloomberg. So uh, one thing I wanted to clarify, each region was given blocks of AS numbers. So that's why you can, it needs to be done, and I believe that was part of the intent of your original question. Um, I believe one of the benefits of this 
is to allow both IP space and ASN numbers to be transferred at the same time through 8.4, whereas right now what you would need to do is an 8.4 transfer of the of the AS number, sorry, of the IP numbers, and not be able to transfer the AS number, but probably use it, but not necessarily know where it's actually being used. So, if, you know, I, I don't know if uh, you can do an 8.2 transfer out of region, which would be a merger and acquisition. So, if you're selling from one unit to another, uh, you couldn't necessarily do it out of region. Um, so, this would allow for some out of region, both basically transfers and sales. Now, just, John, I want to clarify, because I guess the previous question was about maybe the policy is re not relevant because he was talking more about address update, but this policy would also allow to transfer to another organization altogether, correct? Which right. you would not do without this policy. Right. Out of region. Presently, you would do it in region, but not out of region. Presently, a party could say, I have more IP addresses than I need. I'm transferring these numbers to a party in APNIC that has a reciprocal party with, with Aaron and you could transfer IPv4 addresses. If you then said, I also have five AS numbers and I'm, I want to get rid of two of them and I'm going to sell them to the same unit over there in, in Asia Pacific region, we would say that's not possible. We literally will not allow that transfer. Now, you could, you could, they could use them. We don't enforce routing, um, but if you actually wanted to sell the ASs, that's not actually possible per policy. Thank you for that to clarify, Rear Mike. Jeremy Schmeichel from IBBS. Um, so basically, from the way I'm understanding it, this policy is one, one of the main use cases, I guess, from what I understand, is if, say, uh, my business is located here in the United States and it's purchased by a, a larger company or a larger entity that happens to exist in another uh, RIR, and uh, you know the V4 address obviously could be transferred under this policy, but I would have to apply for a new autonomous system number if, let's say, all the resources were moved. However, if I still have a a network footprint here, the majority of the network footprint is here in the Aaron region, um, would, even if the company lived in another RIR, or say like the mailing address for instance was in another RIR, could we technically keep the autonomous system number without any issue? Could, could you repeat that last question, yeah. that last sentence? If the, if the majority of the network footprint is still located <laughs> within the Aaron region, even if the company, let's say corporate headquarters is in another RIR, uh, is that is that an issue? No, that happens today quite a bit, actually. Okay, that's what that's what I thought. So, in my personal opinion, I don't know that this is entirely necessary at this point. Well, I was going to say, are you in favor or against, or no opinion? Uh, opposed at this point. Opposed. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Amy Potter, Hilco Stream Bank. I just have one sort of hypothetical situation that maybe you'll care about, maybe you won't. Um, bankruptcy estates that are selling their IP addresses via inner RIR transfer if they also have um, AESNs. If this policy doesn't exist, then those AESNs are sort of left in this in so between space. I don't know if you care about that. If there are enough that that's not an issue, then maybe it's not necessary so, to have this. So as a point of clarity, my understanding of policy today, in a case that you spoke that they would be able to transfer it to other organizations within the region, and with this policy, if passed, would allow them now to be transferred to other regions with um, like policy, similar policies. Right. Presently, that can only be accomplished within the region, and so if you try to transfer it to a party unrelated outside the region, we would not allow it. We would say you literally cannot sell your AS. Right. So I, I would say that in that situation, you would you'd be left with ASNs that are just. I'm sorry. Could, could you, you speak slowly and clearly? <laughs> sorry, I would say that in that situation, if you ended up selling your addresses to someone in the Asia Pacific region, and the bankruptcy estate still had several ASNs, they would sort of be wasted, just ending up in Never Neverland. Well, the, uh, because yes. no one's gonna. I'm not as a broker. I'm not going to go through the trouble of finding someone to transfer just ASNs to because there's not a lot of value in that for us, so you're just going to end up with these ASNs that don't go anywhere. I don't know if you care about that. So I think if I understand your comment, you're just reinforcing, and I think that was one of the reasons this policy was proposed by the original proposer uh, way back, is that there's an inconsistency in the current specified transfer and that it covers V4 resources but did not cover ASNs for inter-IR. Is that? Yeah, 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 basically. I mean, I'm just saying that there's a hypothetical scenario where you might end up with all sorts of ASNs that don't belong to anyone and right well, the circumstance that happens is that um, the receiving party 
doesn't get the ASs, they remain with the original registrant, that can cause all sorts of interesting issues several years later if it turns out the original registrant doesn't care, the party that's the recipient's using them anyway, the databases don't reflect that. So I don't think we have a, a lot of demand for, for, our, for uh, ASN uh, transfers, but we said the same thing within the region and we've had half a dozen of them occur so there are people who make use of these policies. Hard to tell who and when. And for what it's worth, I've had people approach me trying to get ASNs. So then I would take it that you're in favor of the policy as written? I'm just playing devil's advocate. I'm not sure if it's really necessary if there are enough ASNs out there that there's not like a shortage issue. Okay, thank but you. Other questions or comments before I close the microphones, both remotely and uh, here in the room? This is your last call. Bill, is there anyone feverishly typing? So going, oh, I will Hi. close the mics after this comment. Go ahead, sir. Derek Waldrop, Integrated Broadband. Um, I, I believe inherently that the ASNs don't really hold much value and that it just seems more likely that they would be removed. Uh, most of the purchaser of V4 addresses from a different uh, region, you know, that's what's value to, you know, I, I would think and that they already most likely have their own autonomous system uh, so I, I'm opposed to the transfer. I think it would be more cleanly for them just to basically return and then in the, some case that they needed one, just re apply for a new one within their own region. Okay, so you're not in favor. Okay, so we will now, um, the question I would ask is, we're, this is the, again, the audience participation uh, time. I'd ask those uh, remote and in the room, I'm going to ask a question of whether or not you support moving this policy forward um, this will be advice provided to the Advisory Council. Um, so I would ask for all those in the room who are in favor of uh, moving this pro uh, proposal forward to please raise your hand nice and high. Anyone who can hear my voice is allowed to put their hand up and our counters will count. I, 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 think, I think I got it. There's also the remote obviously. And those that are opposed to moving this forward. <coughs> Please keep them up until I ask. Are they able to put their hands down there, Susan? Okay, you can put your hands down. I don't suppose for the uh, sound, is it possible to get the mics and thing a little bit more in the front? It's just hard to hear some of the questions, I don't know. Okay, just a moment. We're waiting for the envelope. Thank you, Susan. On the matter of policy 2013-1, inter-RER ASN transfers uh, regarding moving it forward in favor, zero, against 12, uh, those in the room and remote, 51. This input will be provided to the Aaron Advisory Council right now for their consideration. Thank you, everyone. John. Okay, going to uh, move right ahead, and uh, next up is... Uh, policy well, 2013-2, which is the 3GPP Network IP Resource Policy. It originated in March of this year. Scott Lyburn and RS are the shepherds, Robert Seastrom. It was presented at Iron 31 in Barbados, um, and there was discussion. It would lower the utilization threshold for additional IPv4 allocations for the 3GPP networks. There's no similar proposals or discussions at other RIRs. Um, it was, uh, it's still in development uh, by the AC, so uh, we'll perform when they've told us it's ready to be reviewed. Um, and now I will invite Scott. Who's coming up for this one? Or Scott. I will invite Scott up. I ask the people when they come to the mic, speak slowly and clearly. Somewhere out there on the end of a webcast Someone is doing a transcription. Think of that person when you speak. Okay. 
So I always talk really slowly and clearly, so I'm going to keep that up. <laughs> so I'm back. Um, this one is a little bit less simple. Um, the original problem statement here and summary of the original proposal was that there is um, at least one mobile network operator that is having some trouble getting enough global unique addresses for their needs. So someone from that operator put together a policy proposal to help address that issue. Um, and that this policy proposal would um, basically relax the 80% requirement in certain situations that um, would allow for, well, I'll get into that in the, this next slide. Um, so they're using a number of non-RAR assigned address blocks internally to provide um, addressing to handsets behind their NATs. Um, RFC 1918 is not large enough for some of these large networks. Um, RFC 6598, the slash 10, doesn't help either. So they have a number of otherwise unrouted blocks that they have been using historically. Um, as that space is brought back into service via returns, reclamations, transfers, et cetera, it um, becomes problematic to have those numbers also being used on the inside of a large mobile network. So they have been going through the effort of renumbering into global unique space that requires some addresses from Aaron to do so. Um, the, there are some technical details that the um, author provided about the way their network architecture works, which I have in an appendix and we can talk about if anybody really wants to. We talked about those fairly extensively at Aaron 31, um, but basically what it comes down to is their failover architecture requires what's essentially 50% um, utilization in that um, one region needs to be able to pick up for another region if there's an outage. So that conflicts with the 80% utilization requirement in the current policy. So we did discuss this at Aaron 31 in Barbados. Um, there were a number of folks who felt this problem was very specific to a single customer's needs and was not more general. Um, one of the questions that we brought to the community was, is this a problem for more networks? There were some folks that um, felt that this was a broader problem, not necessarily for mobile networks that have similar architectures, but just more generally, there are other networks that for various reasons, um, it might be useful to apply a policy that's slightly more relaxed. Um, others felt that there was, we needed more information to really know if this was a problem. So um, obviously if we do address this issue, um, it does fix the problem for at least one um, mobile network operator and probably other um, operators as well. Um, it will allow them to um, reduce excessive use of NAT and address conflicts. Um, obviously making it easier to get IPv4 addresses um, if we're able to do so through the policy cycle before, while they're still here is going to accelerate IPv4 depletion. Um, it's unclear as to whether, as to how many networks this policy proposal would ap uh, apply to and help. Um, it's also unclear as to whether this is the appropriate solution or if there's a architectural or um, technology fix that could be applied. And of course, there are deck tiers. So um, I, I wanted to highlight some of what I thought were the important discussion points that we should talk about here. Um, one is the very obvious one. Is this an important enough problem to solve? Um, the feedback at Aaron 31 was somewhat equivocal on that. And I think what it comes down to is, are we going to have a broad enough um, solution that it's going to apply to other networks. Um, I think there are a number of approaches to solving it, one of which does exactly that, um, which would be to broaden the residential market area section of the policy manual to cover existing devices as well as what it currently covers, which are homes. This is the portion of the policy manual, which I recommend you to pull out and read, or I can bring it up on the slide, that basically says um, for residential ISPs that are serving a number of homes in a region and have to assign addresses to their equipment, they can assign those based on the number of homes served by their infrastructure, whether or not those homes are actually currently using their IP services. So this is classic cable policy. 
um, the approach that the author was wanting to take in his original version of this policy proposal, I think, um, is to do exactly this, to cover folks who have devices, um, many of which are feature phones um, or smartphones that may not happen to be using an address at a given moment, but if those devices are present on the network, that they would be able to apply the same sort of um, 50 to 80 percent utilization ratio that the cable networks can apply. So that would be one approach to solving this problem. Um, there may be others. Uh, we're still interested in feedback from folks who may have ideas. Um, and we're also interested in the question of whether we should move this forward or abandon it. So um, this is the existing NRPM text, which is also in your discussion guide. And then I think I'll leave, the, um, leave this on a slightly um, modified <coughs> version of that, which would possibly address this. And then I'll hand it over to Paul. So I think is uh, actually I'll go back if I can find it. Um, I'd ask if anybody has comments on this proposal. Like I think the most the first point is this a problem that the AC should spend time trying to solve? Um, and if you have a, a view on the approach, that would be useful. And I think this is one that we definitely need some discussion on. So don't all rush up at once. There's only three mics I know. You, Jared you, Mott from NTT. You, you won the race. Go ahead, sir. Perfect. This this seems like um, a provider having very uh, short range vision in how to architect their network. Uh, m coming to Aaron and asking them to change policy to work around their own brokenness, and I do not think that this is something that uh, we should encourage people to do. And therefore, I do not support this. You do not support it. So first, if I may, I'm going to let Scott respond if you'd like. No? Okay. And that's fine. And second, thank you very much to the sound people. That is so much better here on stage to hear. I appreciate that. Next speaker. Uh, Jeremy Schmeichel from Integrated Broadband. Um, I, I agree with the previous sentiment. I, I believe that, uh, especially since this happens to be one mobile provider that was mentioned, I'm sure there are more that are impacted. Um, it, it concerns me that we're looking at changing the policy for everyone just to fix you know, one person's issue, especially when we're already so close to the end of the line for IPv4 as it stands today. I think that, you know, the 80 to 90 percent number, yeah, that, that's probably, you know, pretty fair. I like that suggestion there. But instead, in turn, we should be, you know, pushing these mobile providers and the people that work with the mobile networks that are having issues, you know, as Lee, uh, you know, presented earlier, Android and Apple that do not have IPv6 support yet properly at this time. You know, that really does need to be rolled out in order to not necessarily fix the problem because we all know that dual stack is the way to go and it doesn't even you know fix everything but you know I think it would help alleviate some of the issues so as it stands today due to this being such a small focused problem I don't know that it's necessarily a good way to proceed so opposed I'm opposed yes. thank you sir next speaker Warren Kamari Google so in probably what's the first I actually agree with Jared I'm opposed <laughs> <laughs> so I take it you're opposed Yes, all right, well, the, let it be recorded, he's opposed. Uh, next Matt, speaker. Yeah, Matt Pounsett, Affilius. Um, yeah, yeah, like mostly of this, I'm, I'm opposed because I don't see the point in, in doing something like this first. Um, to to uh, bring up the, the, the cable subscribers uh, issue, that, that was done for a, a specific case where we had a segment of the, uh, the industry that had no control over its own architecture. Um, and we, we did that for because incum incumbents were forcing other organizations into the incumbent architecture, and it was the others that we were trying to solve the problem for. Just because you give me the questioning look there. <laughs> um, we, yeah, we, we were trying to solve a problem for people there who didn't have control over their own architecture. Um, these, people, these organizations do have control over their architecture. Um, you know, that they can find a better way to solve this problem, I think. So opposed. Yes. Next speaker. Lee Howard, Time Warner Cable. Um, boy, you know, it's great not being subscribed to PPML because I can come here and talk about policies and, and, and it's, you know, I've forgotten how much fun it is. To the point, sir, to the point. Um, thank you. The, I, I was struggling to read the discussion in the discussion guide or on the slides. Um, for some specification of which version of IP we're talking about, I, it seems to me there are trillions of addresses available, IP addresses available, and I can't figure out what the problem is. 
Mr. Librand? I think he needs clarification I, I believe first. that we uh, intended to apply this to IPv3. Okay, uh, well, I'm going to take a lead that you were also opposed to this policy. Uh, if there's anybody who would like to speak in favor of the policy, I'd ask you to approach a microphone now or start typing so that uh, Bill Dart can uh, echo your words here in the room. Kevin Bloomberg? Kevin Bloomberg. Um, I'm going to be speaking on behalf of The Wire, which is my company, um, who dates back to the dial-up days. And, you know, to me, this is a, a dial-up problem in some respects. Uh, they would like to have one IP for their customer and one IP for that failover node for that customer as well. Give them two smartphones, whatever the case may be. It's not a well-architected uh, uh, concept. Um, and my concern is that it is going to bleed out. Uh, I don't really care about the IPv4 runout. That's going to happen. But this is going to be an issue. We always have to look at it now in the post runout as well. And this will be a bleed in the post runout. It's a completely inefficient use, and I would have loved for more providers to have come up, and I have not seen those providers come up and say this is an issue. So you're opposed? You're opposed. So this is a, uh, a call to close the mics. I would, if there is somebody who would like to speak in favor, I would urge them to come forward, he or she to come forward now. Are you approaching a mic, sir, or finding a seat? Seat, got it. Anything on the remote, sir? <laughs> We'll close the mics if there are no further questions or comments. Seeing none, we'll close the microphones. We are I'm now, again, just if you can raise your head from email for just a moment and just participate in this one question. Uh, the only question I'm going to start off with is basically, does this community feel this is an important problem to try and solve? If you believe it is a problem we're solving, I'd ask that you uh, raise your hand now and of course participate remotely. I think once again I can assist the counter on that one. Once, got it, got it. You can put your hand down. If you are a, do not think this is a problem that the AC should spend time on solving, I'd ask that you raise your hand now. Please keep it hold just for a moment. Again, if you're remote, please Signify your poll now. You, you may lower your hands now. Thank you. Just a moment. The last Aaron update, John was between you, everyone in coffee. I'm between you and beer. I think I got the short end of the stick on this one. Susan. On the question of whether this is a matter of which the advisory on, on 2013 2 3 GPP network uh, IP resource policy, uh, is this a problem that the advisory council should solve? Zero in favor, 19 against, 51 people participating. This feedback has been provided to the advisory council for their consideration. Thank you. John? Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to continue. Moving right along. Okay, draft policy 2013-4, RIR principles. Uh, it originated uh, just um, a couple months ago, uh, Aaron Proposition 187. Uh, the shepherds are Chris Grunderman, Kathy Aronson, and Owen DeLong. Uh, it was adopted, uh, it was uh, made draft policy uh, in April. The text is online and in your discussion guide. It hasn't yet been discussed. This is the first real chance to discuss it in a uh, policy forum. Um, from the problem statement, the guiding principles of stewardship are not currently being carried into RFC 2050 biz. For background, um, RFC 2050, which is a 15-year-old fo uh, foundational document of the RIR system, is being updated in the IETF. Um, that foundational document has some goals in it, and it also has some allocation policy from 15 years ago. Um, in the revision of it, the goals have been revised, um, and the allocation policy, which is 15 years old and 
and uh, replaced by the RIR system per se, um, is, uh, means that when we look at the new document, there may be concepts that people believe should still be followed by the RIRs, and in particular by Aaron, that aren't in the revised RFC 2050 biz. So the policy proposal uh, takes the, um, the principles that are perceived as missing and suggests that they go into the number resource policy manual. No similar proposals or discussions at other RIRs. Um, legal staff assessment still being developed by the AC, so we haven't done one yet. And I'm going to now turn it over to Bill Dart, who will give the presentation from the AC. Uh, thank you all. Uh, Bill Dart here. So I'm uh, not one of the shepherds for this policy, uh, nor am I the author. Uh, Jason Schiller uh, was the author of this. Chris Grunderman was uh, planning to uh, present today, but had to leave the meeting, so I'm uh, standing instead. The original text, as John said, uh, of RFC 2050 described the registry system for the distribution of globally unique uh, internet addresses and rules and guidelines and principles for those distributions of uh, number resources. Uh, that current work that John referenced uh, has left some of those principal terms out at this stage of its development. And so in Barbados at, uh, at our last public policy uh, meeting, there was a suggestion that perhaps there ought to be a policy that uh, recodified or reintroduced those uh, concepts in, into the uh, number resource policy manual of, of Aaron. So that's what it intends to do, to express those same principles that were um, codified or expressed in 2050 uh, into the NRPM, specifically it would uh, cre create a, I mean, at this stage of the process, by the way, uh, at this stage of the process, we're in discussion only. Uh, that's what a draft policy uh, does, is help us make sure that we have a clear uh, policy statement. So the principles and goals of the Internet Registry, Section 0 would be included in the NRPM. Uh, efficient utilization based on need, that covering the principle of conservation that was in 2050, with a sub-bullet uh, of uh, documented justified needs, that there is needs basis for allocation and assignment of uh, number resources, that there would be uh, support for hier hierarchical aggregation, that uh, again, uh, supporting the uh, 2050 goal of routability and uh, uniqueness uh, through a registration process, again. And uh, all of this is uh, wrapped up in a concluding statement about stewardship. This is what stewardship means. So that uh, is what would be included uh, new in the uh, number resource policy manual if this policy proposal, this draft policy, were to mature uh, gain support in the community. So according to Aaron's uh, public policy, uh, or excuse me, policy development process, we're at this point of trying to assess whether there's community support or not for moving this specific proposal or, uh, or, or not, or something different uh, forward or not. The crux of our need as with the other uh, presentations you've heard today, is to get your support uh, or your comments, whether you support introducing this language so that everything, I mean, basically the NRPM, the Number Resource Policy Manual, has been founded upon these principles in the past. Um, everything uh, that we do in the way of allocation policy, uh, you know, has been predicated on these things. But if a policy like this, similar to this, if language is not introduced into the uh, policy manual, then the authors 
and others uh, in support of this so far have said, then there will be no place to point. We won't be able to point back to 2050 because it will be uh, updated. There will be no place to uh, point and say that our processes and policies are all founded in these principles. So that's the whole point of this. So um, any discussion that you would have upon whether um, these kinds of uh, principles that were originally expressed in 2050 should be expressed in the current public uh, or number resource policy manual. I will say that the discussion that's been on the list, and there's been some hot discussion on the list, a lot of that discussion has been around whether there is a needs basis anymore, whether there uh, ever was a needs basis in the past. I think, you know, there is a lot of discussion that is uh, tangential to this, to the point of are these principles still the principles that we operate by and should they be expressed somewhere where we can point to those foundational principles when people ask us how we run Aaron and make policy and allocate number of resources. Thank you, Bill. Thank you again for standing in for Chris on short notice as well. Um, again, this is, as uh, Bill pointed out, it's, it's er this policy is earlier in the process, so the AC is just looking for feedback on how to move forward with it in the fall. So as always, I would ask you to uh, not, as you have previously, rush to the microphones. Just uh, take your time. Don't. Uh, did, I, did I make it first? You did. Uh, you may go first, sir. As long as you remember to state your name and affiliation. Yeah, uh, Matt Pounsett, Affilius. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that these are definitely the general principles we've operated on and they should con continue to be. I think it's probably more important uh, post runout when we're trying to deal with transfers and, and things like that. When it's that much harder to get address space, it's that much more important that, that needs basis and things like that be maintained. So yeah, I think it's a good idea to, to do this. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Matt? Matt, if you can come back. John had a question for you. Can I ask a question? Um, because this is being predicated on the change from 2050 to 2050 BIS, mm -hmm. and that change, there's goals in 2050 and there's goals in 2050 BIS, um, the language that's in this policy proposal um, is not just the goals what's called principles in here, but as actual allocation policy from 2050. And I guess, have you looked at 2050 BIS to see what more, since that's what's causing this change, have you looked at the differences between the two? I have not done okay. a comparison of the two okay. RFCs, no. Okay, that's what I was curious about. I assume you have, though. Disclaimer, I am one of the co-authors of RFC 2050 BIS, and I'm familiar with it, yes. Uh, other comments or questions? Scott? Scott Librand, um, Aaron AC. So having watched a lot of the discussion and um, read over just the goals section, not the rest of 2050 BIS, um, I am a little bit skeptical that what we have in this initial draft of the po policy proposal is um, the type of thing that is really necessary. Let me rephrase that. The goals in 2050 BIS, I think, capture most of what is captured here. I think what's left is more a description of current um, allocation policy than it is a statement of high-level principles. Um, there probably are a couple of higher level principles that um, we don't have global consensus for any longer because of the, um, the move away from completely needs-based po policy in the face of IPv4 run out that might still be relevant for another year or so in the Aaron region, but I'm not sure that those are things that we want to um, codify in the way that this policy proposal seeks to do. So I am approaching this skeptically. Um, I think the 
the general approach of this um, may have some merit, but as evidenced by the heated discussions on PPML and um, other things, I, I don't, I'm not sure that we're there yet. So I would encourage um, everyone to go back and reread all of the relevant documents and start thinking about ways that um, we can actually do what I would call a gap analysis and find what actually is left that still needs to be described and then have a discussion about what, whether there's actually consensus on those gaps because I see a lot of the areas that are not described in 2050 being the contentious ones and I'm not sure that we have um, a community consensus on what those should be. So I'll be interested to see how that plays out and um, I'm looking forward to a lot of editing and discussion on this one. I don't think it's ready yet. So skeptically uh, supportive of the direction or? It, I am skeptical of the current text and we'll see where it goes from there. Okay. Other comments that would be useful to the AC? We're, again, on this one I would think that we'll probably just pass on the verbal comments and not take a show since it's new and seeing none in the room, I'll just check with Mr. Dart. If Closing the mics, three, two, one, closed. Thank you very much. We'll provide that input to the AC. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And uh, coming up on draft policy 2013-5, LIR, ISP, and end user definitions. So um, back in May, this was submitted. The AC Shepherds, Kevin Bloomberg, Owen DeLong, and John Springer. Draft policy uh, was adopted as a draft policy of the AC, meaning it was understood what it was trying to solve. The text is online and in your discussion guide. Um, it updates the definition of LIR, ISP, and end user. Um, there's no similar proposals or discussions in the other regions. Uh, it is still under development, so we haven't done a staff legal assessment on it. And I'll turn it over to Kevin, I presume, to do the AC presentation. So here are the current definitions um, of what an LIR is or an ISP, an IR that primarily assigns address space to the users of the network services that it provides. LIRs are generally internet service providers. Um, end users, an end user is an organization receiving assignments of IP address spaces exclusively for use in its operational networks. Now, the draft policy um, is trying to help define what an internet service provider is, and this is what it really I wanted to talk about. Um, ISP, the word ISP, the word LIR, the meaning has changed over the last 15 years. Um, and so the question is, does this change that we have here actually change anything, um, or does it just make a couple words look nicer and um, not solve what the in original issue was. So I'm going to go over to that. In Barbados, which was actually cooler than it is in New Orleans right now, um, the, we had a, a staff report that was done that brought up this issue. Um, there is no term ISP in, a, in our NRPM. Um, newer technologies don't necessarily fit into the word ISP. Um, it's kind of hard to define what an end user is or who an ISP is um, and what Really, the crux of it is, is we have policy shopping. So what's gone on is, over the last three to four years, an end user is still at 12 months. Um, an end user has a, a slash 24 as their minimum for multi-homing requirements. They have a much simpler time of it because, quite frankly, end users are smaller. There are less of them. They don't come back very often. They have simpler needs. They don't have to assign to their customers, as an example. And what has happened in the inverse is that ISPs, in the ISP definition, have gone from 12 months to three months. And we're running, we're going into run out. Things are getting more difficult. Um, so by having a very vague um, definition, which has worked for many years, it allows people to say, no, I'm an end user, but you're giving it to your customers to use. But based on the definition, I'm an end user. 
And what, this, what we're looking for, or what I believe the author is looking for in this policy, is to help clarify so that there is less ambiguity for staff and for the community as to what is an end user and what is an ISP. Now we could do it one of two ways. We could try to define what an ISP is, and I, having spent enough time at NANOG, I would be very interested if we had 50 opinions on 20 people in, in what an ISP is. But the question is for the community, as I see it is, what is an end user? Can we define end user and leave the rest to the other category? Would that be acceptable? That's one question I'll pose to, uh, I'll pose to the group. Um, the other question is, if we do this, we're going to be making some subtle changes to what people have expected for many years. A uh, web hosting company potentially that might have been fine in the end user policy might not anymore. They might have to be in the ISP and vice versa. So the, the bar will move, will shift, and what might have been one way will now be a little different. And this will be both in, again, our current scenario and down the road that will have a, an effect on the, the transfer markets, et cetera. So I guess I'm gonna open this up to the floor because really what we're looking for at this stage is as much feedback as we can get at what the easiest way of, and what the community wants in this area is. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out, you know, this definition not, not also only affects the policy under which an organization would under, but it also affects fees, because we do charge different fees there, and whether you are an end user or a uh, lure ISP. So, uh, uh, we pose that there are some questions here posed. I'd ask again if you could uh, rapidly approach the microphone since this is our last proposal. So we might be able to wrap a bit early. And uh, Jeff Handel, Louisiana State University. I fall into the category of I don't know what I am. I'm a university. I assign IP addresses. I have a lot of users. But in your eyes, am I, a, am I an ISP or am I an end user? If you ask me, it depends on the day. So hold on one second. Uh, you're an end user right now, okay? If you ask me, you, we would say that your registration is an end user. You pay lower fees than ISPs, by the way, uh, for very, very, very similar services. Um, it is also true that there are some criteria that are different for end users and ISPs for obtaining initial and new allocations. As we get towards the run out of IPv4, in the pool, people will um, self-select <laughs> which criteria is most favorable to them. And that's fine as long as the community expects that to be happening. It's also true that someone who can't get additional space could be asserting to Aaron, my business model has changed by pure coincidence. You happen to be running out of address space, but my business model happens to change, and now I'm no longer an ISP, so can I have some more numbers? And so we have the question of someone claiming, do we worry about that, or do they self-declare which they are? So Got it? So that clarify it? A bit more. A any feedback on the questions that are posed, or? Actually, I do think this would be worth clearing up to see what you are, especially as being as a university. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Jeremy Schmeichel from Integrated Broadband. Um, you know, in my industry, I actually we work with uh, you know a couple hundred tier two and three cable MSOs, uh, you know, throughout the air and footprint. And um, you know, the, the way that the policy is uh, written, as as I read it, you know, currently is basically defining an end user as someone who doesn't. Let's say, I'm, I'm assuming you're meaning as in swipping certain amounts of address space to subscribers and behind your network. Is that correct? As I understand it. You're, you're saying the current definition of ISP versus... No, not, not, sorry, not the current, the, the proposed, the proposed. what I read in the proposal. He asked about the proposed. Scott? Yes, that's a pretty good summary. Okay, I was just making sure. So let, let's say that I'm a cable ISP and, uh, you know, I, I get an allocation from Aaron and all of my address space is simply DHCP to the cable customers in behind me and I don't have to swip any address space. Would I then be an end user? John, how would you interpret that? Uh, under the, under, under the, the proposed, proposed policy... Correct. If all you did was um, provide internet services and let's say an end user an organization receiving assignments for use on its network and does not register any reassignments. 
So, so if you do not register any reassignments, then um, you're an end user. Okay, I was just was wanting clarification on that. Thank you. Right. Uh, I think actually I had Scott. Did you have a question or were you okay? Far mic. Jared Motch, NTT. So uh, the one thing that I noticed is that in this booklet that I was handed. Uh, and, that thanks, I and thanks to the staff who put that together, by the way, they do a lot of work to prepare uh, for that. In section two, you have a definition section. Yes, we do. Do you, do you intend to define what ISP is as an acronym that you use throughout as you do similar acronyms here uh, as part of this? Yes. Because I don't see the that in The here. bootstrap problem, right? Yes. I think that is a good takeaway for the AC to decide if they need to clarify. I, I think it's a good point out. I'll, I'll see if I can address that. Um, the acronym ISP expands to Internet Service Provider. That's in the text of the new 2.4. Yeah, it is right before. Sure. I, I, I understand that, but I think the question is defining the end user sites, the university who's not quite sure are they an ISP because they may have departments or other people they may sub-assign things to uh, and whatnot. Would it be valuable to put that there? And it's it's an, a question that I don't feel needs to be answered, but it's just uh, a question of whether or not it makes sense to enumerate that further to provide clarity so people don't try and drive trucks through holes. I, I want to ask a question to make sure I understand. The proposed text functionally defines the difference between an ISP and an end user. You're suggesting enumerating certain types of organizations are one versus the other. You're suggesting a ISP includes a university. Universities are ISPs. And community colleges are ISPs. I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, through the community feedback process, you, it may be valuable if you further document that. And, and what I'm saying is that someone would need to suggest text as to what organizations end up in that enumeration. Sure. Thank you. Uh, over to Kevin Bloomberg first. So just a quick question. Uh, sorry you sat down. <laughs> is it easier to define ISP or is it easier to define the end user? Because my concern is that ISP is a very long-term moving target uh, that we've seen. So I guess my question for you is, is end user an easier term to define than ISP? Or does six of one half dozen of another? Thank you, Kevin. Next mic. Matt Poundset, Affilius. Um, I think that if an organization that provides internet access is not defined as an ISP under this text, then this text is broken. And so in other words, the interpretation that John gave earlier, you feel is, suggests the text is broken? Yes. So, okay. I, I would agree with you. I did not intend for MSOs to be classified as end users. Um, by the way, Scott Librand, Aaron AC, author of this text. Um, <laughs> so in full, in full disclosure. <laughs> so my first off, um, as mentioned in the policy text rationale, whatever it is, um, my organization is neither an ISP nor an end user by strict reading of the current text um, because we are not primarily providing internet access and we are not exclusively doing it to our own equipment. We're some of both. Um, I think it's important to clear up that I'm neither thing. Um, I think it's important to tighten up these definitions a little bit. I do not think it is important to lock down every single possible edge case as either one or the other. Um, while, there, while Aaron's staff um, likes to have things cut and dried in policy so that they can do their job more easily, um, I am inclined to put more work on them when it benefits the community, and I think um, having policy that um, is a little bit flexible in this situation might be good. Now, in, in the well-known innumerable cases like universities, MSOs, I think the text should go ahead and be clear enough to make it unambiguous what those are. But for some new cloud-type service that is sort of like an ISP and sort of like an end user, I'm not personally opposed to having them be able to choose which policy applies to them. And if the policies are so different that everyone's always making the wrong choice by some definition, then perhaps we need to look at um, that distinction and tighten that up. But 
Uh, that's kind of where I was thinking as when I wrote this text. I think it does need to be tightened up a little bit, um, but I would like to hear feedback from the community as to whether you think we need to explicitly define everything or whether it's okay to leave some ambiguity in here. I think I've heard a lot of, yeah, we should work on this type. So I think while it's valid to hear the community, I think it's, uh, as was pointed out earlier in the presentation, um, you know, I think this proposal came out of a, a staff report uh, that's given at each one of our, uh, our regular errand means that staff have had struggled with this. So I think if staff are struggling, I think it behooves us to, to discuss it because that means they're having a problem doing it and their job is to execute the policy that, you know, the, er the community passes. I believe the far mic was, sorry, John, did you have to add something? Yes. My apologies. Um, so actually uh, we can do whatever the community wants and so if you want loose definitions those are great and those work fine if you have two very clear definitions that says the world is made up of A and B but you've defined A and B very tightly you may find out there's a lot of C's that don't qualify for A or B so you need to decide the philosophy here okay if it's that they can choose then it's pretty easy to have some light definitions of either. We don't really care. They can choose. If it's that you want a hard line to either be qualified as an end user or to be qualified as an ISP, that also works as long as there's only one hard line that we're enforcing. If we try to enforce two hard lines, we actually end up with organizations that are A or B or I don't meet either and that's the problem you face. So the philosophy of what the community wants is very important before you decide which definition structure you want to have. Can anyone just discuss fees? Help me okay. Far Mike, first. It was just a quick comment, Jeremy Schmeichel from Integrated Broadband. I, I, I didn't mean to necessarily introduce that loophole. It's just, you know, due to the work that I do, I work on behalf of several, you know, cable MSOs that are smaller, and so that is the first thing that springs to mind. It's I want to make sure that we have a clear definition uh, to a certain extent, obviously, because we don't need to introduce all the C's, but I, I think that this is a, a valuable discussion and that we should definitely work together as a community to help come to those definitions. Thank you. And Senator Mike was uh, next. Yeah, Matt Pound said again. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of feel like that, that, that doing it by defining the end user might actually not be the easiest way to do it. Because the, the thing that I think we're concerned about is the workload on staff and the resource um, usage of ISPs, they're they are the the larger uh, resource drain, right? For both for both workload and and for number of resources. Um, so they, I think it's ISPs that we are concerned with, and I think so. It's probably easier, and so I think that any organization that shows some ISP behavior, even if it's not all of what they do, should be an ISP. Um, so I think it's probably easier to define that than than to say people who do this are this are end users and everyone else is an ISP. Matt, I'm actually really impressed with that little snippet. I'm going to have to use that. ISP behavior rather than a specific definition. Yeah. That, that actually, I think, for me, um, really embodies what, what this is about. And, and we'd, be, we'd be able to take that, but we don't know who you are. Sorry, Kevin Bloomberg, The Wire, Aaron AC. Yeah. So, so I think, I th so I mean, we can probably get it down to a small list of things, right? Uh, people who provide internet access to other organizations or to, or to individuals, right? P and p people who SWIP resources. Um, I, think, I think even just those two things would probably cover 99% of them. Um, uh, you know, there might be one or two other uh, simple things we, need, we would need to throw in there. I haven't thought about it for very long. But, um, but I think that might be an easier approach, is to say that here, here are things that are, ISP, that are ISP behaviors. Anyone who does these things is an ISP. Everybody else is an end user. Thank you. In fairness, I'll just check with remote participation. No? Um, I'm going to be closing the mic soon and so that you're not thrown off. Uh, there won't be a poll question as we've had previously. So if you want input, even just to say, uh, get your two cents in, please approach a microphone now. Closing microphones. Once, twice, three closed. Last so question, to you, comment to you, sir. So Jake McClare from Dyne. Um, my, my hesitation with what Scott said is, while it's very true you want to be flexible, um, confusion and frustration don't lead to flexibility. Um, I guess I, what I would envision is an applicant having to choose with vague knowledge of, of interpretation and then your staff 
there's this back and forth where it's kind of like, so who's interpreting what? Um, so I guess my, my question would be to you, especially directed at like the staff interpretation, is um, I, I'm guessing they probably want some, some examples maybe, uh, maybe to Jared's point, maybe and there's some kind of separate document that just gives examples and that's not tied into the to, to the bylaws or what whatever formal documentation um we're, we're you know we're we're solidifying here so that you have flexibility to adopt that over time thank you john yes nope. okay so I think that's a very good suggestion uh, regarding having examples. When we get to the other end of this and we know what the rules are, it would be nice to have some examples so someone can say, oh, I'm one of those, and that's easier. Uh, I'm going to raise an aspect now, and this might be worth, this might reopen the topic and might encourage people to come to the microphones. Recognize that the Aaron fee schedule for ISPs is um, significant recurring annual fees for your number of resources. And the fee schedule for end users is a small maintenance fee each year. Um, and this has been the practice since Aaron inception. was found, it was its inception. Um, so this means that parties, you know, if two parties have a, both of them have six slash 16s and one's an end user and one is a ISP, the ISP is paying several thousand dollars per year um, for $8,000 per year, and the end user is paying a maintenance fee of $100 per year. Um, generally, if people have a choice of paying several thousand per year or $100 per year, um, as much as they're altruistic, um, they choose to pay the lesser amount. And so this means that we need to be careful because if people can self-select we could find ourselves having to face the financial consequences of everyone saying, I'm actually getting the same services and I'm just going to pay a lot less money. So people who feel that the answer to this is normalize the services, uh, normalize the fees, people who think the answer to this is differentiate the services, um, please come to the mic. That would be a helpful aspect of this when we talk about ISP versus end user self-selection. Conveniently, somebody has approached the mic. Uh, Jared, Jared Motch, NTT. I, I am probably an ISP, and hopefully we pay our fees. Um, is, is this that big of a problem? Or if the fees are aligned, is that going to present a significant uh, uh, budgetary challenge for Aaron? When you say aligned, is if, is if one if, line? If, if the fees converge such that everyone is paying a relatively the same amount, it depends which way they converge, I guess, but... A lot of end users would become very upset and would look for the person who submitted that suggestion and hunt him down. If, it, yes, it, but if it were to go the other way or to... It, oh. it, well, it can't. I mean, end users paying $100 per resource block record per no, no, year. No. So anything... I, I, I have no idea how the Aaron budget stuff works. Perhaps that's through my own ignorance and because I don't pay a lot of attention to the process. If all the ISPs stop paying their fees or start paying the end user fee, will that, that would, yeah. how will that impact Aaron? 80% of Aaron's revenues are ISP fees. Okay. So if the ISPs come, fees come down to meet the end user fees, it would get interesting. Okay. I think as treasurer, I would have to say that would put us in a serious position, yes. Okay. Other people that would like to approach on this topic? Center microphone. I'll have to raise it a bit. Uh, Aaron, you speaking for myself. Uh, I was just kind of sitting here thinking about the future of enterprises and end users, subsequent allocations, E6 requests, uh, reporting requirements, and that it will probably evolve over time end users will probably require more resources from Aaron and maybe should pay some more fees or maybe not. Uh, and that reporting might require things like swipping. Enterprises and end users might start looking more like ISPs. So we should, I would suggest we are careful about language in what 
looks like an ISP means as we as a community have absolutely no idea what an enterprise is going to look like over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Thank you, that's a good comment. I will uh, close the mics again on this topic in just a second. We have about 10 minutes left in this session, so we can potentially escape a bit earlier. Going once, twice, remote participation check. Nope. Sold. Thank you very much for your involvement. I'll turn it over to John to finish up. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for participating in this session. Uh, I remind people that we're going to be talking about these same things at the next Aaron meeting, which is a joint Aaron Nanog meeting, and that's coming up in October. Uh, in the meantime, if you have views on these policy proposals, they're all online. They're actually a, a mailing list that gets a couple of messages each day called the Public Policy Mailing List. You're welcome to join it. There's an active discussion of these, and uh, your views are more than welcome. Um, if you have any comments particular to these, your advisory council, your elected Aaron advisory council, the folks from the community are the ones you should seek out and you can express your views or help the, ask them to help explain uh, aspects of this that may not have been covered. Thank you everyone for coming and enjoy the rest of your evening.